Well, good afternoon. It is still daylight. I'm not really going too dark quite yet, so I'm not going to say evening. That's just me. Y'all may, may, may already realize that about me. But that's all right. I wish I had thought about these the last two hymns as I was preparing my message, and I could have included them in some way. Because, and I'll try to throw it in right now. We're commanded to be holy. We're commanded to be holy in this life. Because we are supposed to have a victory in Jesus in this life. And if we're not holy in this life, we cannot have a victory as we live on the earth. That's why we were sanctified. So... I just wanted to get that put that in and then go on with our, my, our message this evening. Now, you remember last week I had two sets of scriptures. Oh, I read the first one and then I made some comments and then I had what I call my text. I began doing that in preparation and it's just become a habit to have two portions of scripture. But this evening, I want to read first from Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. And the Lord Jesus Christ tells us, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in, go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. As we read this portion of scripture, I ask you, to, to whom is this spoken? To whom is, is Jesus addressing these words? Well, if we consider this morning's message from John 3, 16 and 17, these scriptures, as well as the whole Bible, are speaking to the world of those whom God loved enough to send his only begotten son into, that he might die for his people on the cross. Thus, this scripture and all of scripture is addressed to all of the elect of God, whether they have been born again or not. In no way, in no way does it address the non-elect, for they do not have the ears to hear, for they have not been given the heart of flesh which enables them to hear. Thus the word of God is not directed to them. However, I'm not a judge. You are not a judge of who the elect are. Who would have ever thought that that thief on the cross was one of the elect of God? Our responsibility is to share the gospel throughout the world and to walk according to how Jesus walked. Our text is Galatians 6, chapter 5. I'm going to be reading verses 16 through 25. And here the Apostle Paul gives us, and more, gives us more instruction concerning the walk of the elect in the narrow way as we are in the world, but not of the world. Verse 16 starts. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, Envyings, murders, drunkenness, reveling, and such like. Of the which I tell you, 
I tell you before, as I have always told you in the past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the afflictions and the lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Will you pray with me? Fathers, we've read these two passages of instruction from thy word. Thy word which you have inspired those, these writers to, to record for us that we might be more perfect as we try to serve you. Father, we thank you for thy word. We thank you for these men whom you call to write. And Father, we just thank you that it's been preserved down through the years. Now, Father, as we look at these, these words and, and, and I try to speak on them, Lord, I ask your blessing for your blessings. I ask that my words might be clear, that the meaning of my words would be clear, and that, Father, more, most importantly, that they praise you and give glory to thine only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray and ask forgiveness of sin. And amen. As we look back at that call to worship for a few moments, we're told that there are two ways in life for God's people. Two ways in life for God's people. A way of obedience, which we call the narrow way. And when you live in obedience, we live in the joy of our salvation. And then there's a disobedient way. The broad way, as it was described which is really a dead and ineffectual and fruitless uh, spiritual life. And sadly, some of God's people do live in this way. Now, Paul's, uh, God's word through the Apostle Paul gives us some more instruction concerning the walk of the elect in the narrow way as we are in this world, but again, not of the world. The born elect of God and those who have been born again or will be born again have passed, have passed from death into life. We are sinners. We are sinners who have been or will be forgiven of our sins eternally and who are called upon to walk in the narrow way. We have been made able to walk through the straight, break, straight gate, but we also have the ability to decide to walk in that wide gate due to our Adamic nature. We look at verses 16 and 25 of our reading. Paul tells us in both places, walk in the Spirit. Spirit with a capital S, meaning the Holy Spirit. Walk with the Holy Spirit. So thus he's, he's telling us to walk with the Spirit, to walk we're in the narrow way, in the straight gate. And for right or wrong, I don't remember if I made used this reference last week with y'all or not, or somewhere else. But this, th these instructions remind me of the instructions that Dorothy and her, fr her companions got when they were told to stay on the yellow brick road. They were supposed to stay on that road and follow it as they went to see the wizard. And what happened? We know they failed. They went out into the poppies and we know, know what kind of problems they had because of it. I never really liked that movie, particularly because of this portion, because it would remind me of the failures. It would remind me of those times in my life when I was not living in a way that would have pleased the Lord. Beloved, as we walk in the Spirit, we're to be pleasing the Lord. It is to experience that abundant life of which Jesus spoke of in John 10, 10, where he said that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. Now, in these verses here in Galatians 5, 
Paul is showing us the difference between the two pathways. We, the two pathways that we as the children of God can choose to walk in life. And yes, I reiterate this, even the child of God can walk the wrong path. He can, he can go around and he can wander in that wander in the field of poppies, which I'm calling the broad way. So as we look at our walk, I, I like to look first at not walking in the spirit. But before we go there, I got a little more talking to do. I come sometimes get out, get ahead of myself. In verse 17, we see the warfare between the flesh and the spirit. And this is what causes the conflicts in our lives. This is what causes the, the wrong decisions that we make at times. The flesh, the flesh seems or, or seeks to hinder, if you will, the spiritual nature of our lives. The flesh does not want us to pray. The flesh does not want us to study God's word. He doesn't want us to, it, or rather, it doesn't want us to uh, witness. It doesn't want us to be faithful. It doesn't want us to obey God. And, and we could go more and more. But in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, we're told, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from lustly flesh, fleshly lust, excuse me, which war against your soul. So uh, Paul's telling us, Peter's telling us, Jesus has told us. So we're reminded once again that our lives are not a ball field. We're not on a ball field, but we're on a battleground. Because of our sinful nature. And we're, we're, we'll be looking at verses 19 through 21 in just a moment. I'm sorry to say that because of our sinful natures that we are capable of anything. We can Anything that we can imagine, we can do. And there are probably some things that we can't even imagine that we might would do. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10 and 12, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth, I'm up here strong. I got this covered. I better watch myself. Because Paul says, I'm to take heed lest I fall. Do you think, or can you imagine that Peter would ever think that he would deny the Lord? Yet he did three times. Who would have ever thought that David, a man after God's own heart, would, would sin with Bathsheba and then have her husband Uriah murdered? Were they, would you have thought they were capable of that? So without exception, oh, well, let's go on back to further in history. Who would have ever thought that Cain would have killed his brother Abel? So without exception, in the flesh, we are capable of anything. Even Paul had his problems. He tells us this in uh, Romans 8, or excuse me, 7, 18 and 19. If I get tongue-tied here, y'all forgive me. Paul writes this, so he says, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I evil which I would not, that I do. I want to do good, he says, yet I find that myself. I want to stay on the road and then I get out in the fields. I know to stay on the road. So in verses 19 through 21, Paul lists those 17 sins, and then he says. Seventeen of them, folks. He says then, and such 
light, which indicates that this ain't all, folks. There's more. There are other sins that man is capable of. Let's look at the second part of verse 21. He says, of the which I tell you, excuse me, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not enter the kingdom of God. As I read this, my mind goes to two places. Revelation chapter 20, in particular verse 12, where we see those who would be judged out of the books, plural, the books, not the book of life, which is a singular book. They would be judged out of those books according to those words. And these are those that we spoke of this morning in Matthew 25, who would be set on the left-hand side Jesus says in that verse, uh, Matthew 25 and 41, Then shall he say unto them on the left, left hand, Depart from me, ye wicked, excuse me, Depart from, from me, ye cursed, Into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. But beloved, I hate to tell you this, but even as a child of God, even as we are children of God, we shall not go unscathed. We will be judged. And we will be chastened. We will be punished in this life. All right, it's in Hebrews 12, 6, he says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receiveth. And then in 1 Corinthians eleven thirty two, 32, he says, but when we are judged, we are chastised of the Lord. And the good part of that, that we should not be condemned with the world. Now with this knowledge, with this knowledge that when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the knowledge that we have is that we have already received our chastisement and that Christ has already borne our stripes and that we are going to be set on the right hand by his love. What, this is the incentive, brothers and sisters. This is the incentive, incentive to walk in the spirit and to enjoy the victories of that walk. That's the victory. The, the, the victory in Jesus that we're talking about as we live in there, here in this life. Got a couple of victories mentioned in, in verses 16 and uh, verse 18. <coughs> verse 16 tells us that we can have a, fit, a victory over the lust of the flesh, over those 17 plus uh, sins that we, were li that we listed. We can have a victory over it. Now, we may not do any works unto, uh, uh, unto salvation or to gain our salvation, but our works do determine the joy of our walk here in the earth. Yes, Satan is going to tempt us. Therefore, we need to avoid uh, places. We need to avoid people. We need to avoid things and images and music and anything else that might bring temptation to us. I like what uh, Solomon wrote there in Proverbs 6, verses 27 and 28. He says there, Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? And then verse 28, Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? We get, out, we, 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 we get into those places around those people that bring temptation to us, we're going to get burned. So we need to make our choices carefully lest we do use the joy of our salvation. So we, as we walk by the Spirit, though, uh, 
We also receive a victory over the law. Verse 18 tells us that we're going to have a victory over it. So when we walk in the Spirit and we yield to God's commands, and these are those commands that have been written in our hearts, we have been given a victory over the law and the sacrificial commandments thereof, which have never been, which have never been a condition of salvation. The sacrificial, the, the commandments, and the sacrifices that were made were but a remembrance again against uh, made of sins every year. And then Paul continues to write there, for it is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away every sin. That's what he writes in Hebrews 10, 3 and 4. So our keeping of these commandments uh, within our heart is a manifestation as we, as we obey these commandments of God that he's put into our hearts and, and, and people see it in us. It is a manifestation of our love of our Savior. Christ said in 14, John 14, 21, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Keeping his commandments show that you love me. Show that you love me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. So our works, that's almost, that's, I, that's not a nasty word. I preach works all the time. And this is, here it is again. We work because of salvation. What is it? Second ten, uh, Ephesians 2 and 10 in the good works that we were created unto. So our works show our love for him when we live a spirit-filled life. Again, sadly, the warfare between the flesh and the spirit remains within us. And it's our place to stand in the whole armor of God against the wiles of the devil and we're to stand and show our determination as we walk, as we submit to the Spirit. Now I want to jump down to verses 22 through 25. And this is where we find that by walking in the Spirit, we receive a victory more and above this life. Because when we walk in the Spirit in this way, we abide in the vine and we bear fruit. Attached to the vine, we have the characteristics of the vine. You ever see something besides a grapevine come out of a grapevine? A, bra a great branch come out of a grapevine? Our works, our fruit, bear witness of Christ's love for us and our love for him and our salvation. So what I want to do now, if you will, will continue to bear with me, is look at the listed fruit briefly, each one briefly. First one that's mentioned is love. It talks about the love of God, our love of God, our love for our neighbor and our love for ourselves. It's been a while, but many years ago I was taught to conjugate verbs. And if I remember correctly, this is how it was. I am, you are, he or she is. Any English majors in here that can correct me if I'm wrong? Thus to con conjugate the word love, we would say I love, you love, he or she loves. Now, in my reading this past week, I found that the verb conjugation in Hebrew is just the other way around. It says, he is loved, you are loved, I am loved. Now, follow me here. He is loved. They are loved. I am loved. Matthew 22, 37 through 39 says, 
Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Love God. The second is, uh, is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor, those around you, as thyself. Do you see it? Jesus teaches us to God to love God first. We're to love God in the first person, our, na na our neighbor in the second person, and ourselves in the last person. So we move on to joy. Joy is, from what I can understand, is a constant delight in the Lord, uh, as Paul wrote about it in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 16. Now, I've got a, a short quote that I want to share with you. I forgot where I got it, who I got it from. But it says, a Hindu trader in India once asked a missionary, what do you Christians put on your face to make it shine? We're surprised the man of God answered, I don't put anything on it. The Hindu began to lose patience and said emphatically, Yes, you do. All of you who believe in Jesus seem to have it. I've seen it in the towns of Agra and, and, and Sutra and even in the city of Bombay. Suddenly the Christian understood and his face glowed even more as he said, Now I know what you mean. And I will tell you the secret. It's not something that we put on from the outside, but it's something that comes from within. It's the reflection of the light of God in our hearts. I wish I had thought of that. That's good. Peace. Jesus has left us. Jesus has left us with the ability to, express, to experience peace in three ways. We can experience peace with him or through him. We can experience peace with our neighbors. And then we can also, coming back to those that Hebrew uh, verb conjugation, we can be at peace with ourselves. Jesus says, I, give, I leave you with peace. My peace I give unto you. It's ours. He's given it to us. Not as the world gives it. Give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus has given us something the world cannot. Long suffering, patience, the ability to hold your temper for a long time. But it's more than that. It's also being kind to one another. It's being tender-hearted and forgiving to, uh, of one another. Ephesians 4 and 32 says, or quote part of it, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Long suffering. How long did he suffer as what, what, was the, what was the number of years as God long suffered for uh, Noah to build the ark? 120 years? That's long suffering. Next, I wanted to look at gentleness and meekness kind of together. These are a manner of being humble, being of a humble and quiet spirit. But they are not to be interpreted as weakness, but it's to be interpreted as, as power used with restraint through wisdom, wherein we forbear one another in love. Jesus described himself as weak. Take, take my yoke upon you, he says, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. Beloved, I don't believe that gentleness and meekness is a weakness, but it's an exhibi exhibition of 
control of the power that is within us. The text said Jesus was me. No, uh, Numbers 12 and 3 says that Moses were me. I don't think so. Not in the sense of it being weakness. They were meek in that they had the strength to control goodness. I had, couldn't help but think of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Which of course is taken from Matthew 7 and 12. And this again, this throws us right back to the uh, the second commandment is to love thy neighbor as thyself. Our, our goodness is defined by our actions. Just as we cannot show our faith without our works, we cannot show our goodness without our works. And then faith. Faith is, is trusting that God will do what he has said even though we cannot see him, nor are we always going to see the results of his promises. Faith is showing our love for him more than fear, showing our love more than any shame or even duty. Faith is the reason that we want to do what's right in his sight. We always refer to Hebrews 11 and 1 when we're talking about the faith. But we are told to grow in faith. The faith that is giving up, given us is a seed. I don't know how many are farmers in here. It doesn't matter. But just as a farmer plants a seed in the ground and fertilizes it and waters it, that it might grow, we must water and fertilize our, the faith that's been planted within us. We must grow our faith. Before, without going there, I'll just remind you or ask you to think of the parable of the mustard seed, which grew into a great, a great tree in Luke 13 and 19. And then temperance. I'm afraid I've got another movie reference here. I'm currently re-watching an old Western movie that's named the Hallelujah Trail. It's a comedy. It's a Western comedy about a wagon train of liquor being hauled to Denver in the 1860s. And then there's, there, there's another wagon train coming along trying to catch up to them and to interfere with them that's loaded with temperance ladies. And if I remember correctly, there's, there's guard, armed guards coming along and the Indians coming along they're all trying to get the, get uh, some of the liquor, but the things that they made, the men pulling the liquor feared most was the temperance ladies. For well, temperance here is it's not talking about that type of temperance. Well, it does cover it a little bit, but temperance here is speaking about self control. It's talking about Refusing to do the to do that which you have power to perform, and yes, as I said, that's even over the uh, over the consumption of alcohol. Temperance is laying aside all the weights and hindrances and besettings of sin. Temperance is rendering our lives as living sacrifices. <laughs> I want to go back to verse 22. Paul writes there, but the fruit of the Spirit is, quote unquote. The word fruit is singular. The verb is is singular. These nine points that Paul has written about or we've spoken about here or like a braided nine-strand rope. And that nine-strand rope 
is woven into our lives at all times. And if we walk in the Spirit, the evidence of these nine, I can't call them fruits, but they may be, because they all, they all are one fruit. But they will all be seen in us by the world as we walk in the Spirit. Beloved, we walk when we walk in the, battle, in the narrow way. We are walking in our own battlefield with conflicts on every side, yet we have a strength that Christ has given us to endure. So I ask your forgiveness one more time. I'm going to close with a question in reference to that movie, The Wizard of Oz, once again. My question to you and to myself are we staying on the yellow brick road or are we wandering around in the poppy field? I can't answer that question to you. I can say that every, time, every now and then I wander. But the Lord is forgiving and brings me back. As I close, I would ask what the Invitational hymn is 451. The invitational hymn is number 451. If it is any, if there's anyone here who would like to declare your love of Christ and become a member of Love Chapel Primitive Baptist Church, that invitation is open to you. And y'all will stand with me, please, and we'll sing verse 3 and the last of 451, trust and obey.